Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining this um, exciting webinar on the International Day for Clean Air and the Blue Skies. Um, we have a really exciting lineup of panelists for you today and speakers uh, with presentations. We're hoping to make it really um, interactive with you as the audience. Um, and thank you for spending your time with us today. Uh, my name is Tanzid Alam, and I am the Managing Director of Earth Matters Consulting. We're a um, small boutique consultancy firm focused on helping to address the climate crisis and environmental conservation issues. Um, we've been established since 2017 based in the UAE. Um, for you, the point of today is not to hear from me too much. I'm just helping to facilitate and moderate the dialogue. So um, we will have um, interaction with you as the audience today. We invite you to um, use the Q&A function on Zoom to submit any questions, which we'll try to answer um, during the Q&A session. Um, also, feel free to have dialogue with each other on the chat box. Um, we understand some people feel comfortable sharing questions through the chat box, so we can also try to um, bring those questions forward to, to the speakers as well. Um, the webinar will be recorded. Uh, it already is being recorded, and um, there'll be a summary that will be developed at the end as well. Um, it's the first in a series of two webinars as well. We'll hear more about that. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce first His Excellency Andrea Matteo Fontana, who is the European Union's ambassador to the, um, to the UAE. So over to you, Ambassador um, Andrea. Thank you very much, Tanzid. Um, I first want to start by wishing everybody a, a good day, uh, International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies that brings us uh, together uh, today. Um, the UN this year chose uh, to dedicate this, uh, uh, this day to healthy air and healthy planet as the main theme. And I think that um, it's, um, uh, it makes us think about the correlation between the importance of the clean air and the importance of a clean planet. It also makes us think about uh, uh, the pandemic that is still ongoing uh, globally. And um, in a way, there are similarities there between uh, uh, the threat of the pandemic and the threat that comes from air pollution. These are global problems that need global solution. Uh, and these are issues that we can only solve if we work together internationally, globally, um, in order to uh, try and, and resolve these issues that have a huge impact on the health of humanity and the health of the planet. Now, when I look at the effects of, uh, of air pollution globally and the, in the EU, um, the air pollution has uh, uh, huge negative consequences for humanity and for the planet. Globally, um, according to the WHO, there are 7 million premature deaths worldwide every year because of air pollution. In the EU, we have 400,000 premature deaths in the EU out of a population of 450 million people. So these are huge number. And uh, uh, of these people, many are uh, dying of chronic diseases such as uh, cancer. So humanity suffers and the planet is suffering. And pollution is one of the main drivers for biodiversity loss, threatening the survival of up to 1 million species, plant and animal species. So this is the scale of the problem that we are facing today. And this is why it is important that today um, we focus on this problem and we think about what we can do together in order to solve this uh, transboundary issue. The EU, in response uh, to this, um, has recently adopted a zero pollution action plan for air, water, and soil. So it includes air, but not only, also water and, and soil. And this is a building block of the European Green Deal, which uh, I'm sure people have heard about it, is the European Union contribution to uh, fight climate change and preserve the people and planet. Uh, so the Zero Pollution Action Plan 
uh, is a part of the Green Deal. And the goal there is uh, to better protect the health of EU citizens, but also of other global citizens, as well as the health of the planet. And this is all part of the European vision to build back better and to seize the uh, opportunities that come from the uh, COVID crisis, uh, which is of course a, a human tragedy, but also um, gives us the possibility to take a step back and see what we need to do in order to build a, a better tomorrow for humanity and for the planet. So as I said before, um, air pollution is a transboundary problem. It doesn't recognize borders. And this is why it is important that we work together. And for this, we take the opportunity of this um, UN day today to work with colleagues from Switzerland who are with us on the panel from the UN. And we link this to the Sustainable Development Goals, which is the, the global effort, the international effort, in order to um, see how we can solve these problems together. Zero pollution is about uh, health. It's also about uh, quality of life. It's about uh, food security for everybody. Uh, and this is how it fits uh, with the sustainable development goals. It's also about uh, equality. It's also about making sure that more people around the world have the same opportunities, the same chances. So I think that it's something that can uh, um, activate people around the world in order to contribute with their small actions, everyday actions, or larger actions when I look at what industry can do in order to improve the situation around air pollution. Um, let me say that uh, uh, everybody has uh, a, a role to play. So it's not just about uh, policymakers, not just about the EU or the UN. It's also about uh, science. It's also about uh, the private sector and, uh, and industry. And we have to find a holistic solution to a problem that will require a, a rethink and a restructuring of the way we produce and the way that we um, work through our economies uh, uh, worldwide. So this is um, this is why we have different people today on on the panel. Let me say before I close that uh, uh, after today's event, um, we will follow up with a, a joint event during Expo Dubai 2020, again together with our uh, Swiss colleagues, where we will uh, think about uh, again the problem of uh, air pollution and uh, uh, in particular how the transport sector can help us uh, to uh, solve this problem and improve uh, the quality of air worldwide. So I want to say to our viewers that we're looking forward to welcoming you uh, to this event on the 12th of October at Expo 2020 Dubai, uh, so that we can continue the conversation about the importance of clean air. So last before least, I want to uh, end my presentation by asking everybody to switch on their cameras so that we can take a family picture before we continue. Thank you to everybody for joining us and thank you for the organizers for preparing this important workshop. Cameras on. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Excellent opening remarks there. And um, while I have the cameras open of all the other panelists, I'd like to do it just quickly run through and introduce everyone else to you today. Um, so we also have Francisca Freiburghaus, who is the Regional Head of Sustainable Development at the Swiss Embassy in, in Abu Dhabi. And, um, and then she'll be giving some remarks next. And then we have uh, in the panelists in running order, if you could please just wave as I read out your name, we have Professor Drew Schindel, who is the um, Chair of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition Scientific Advisory Panel. Welcome, Drew. Um, we also have um, engineer Aisha al Abduli, who is the acting um, assistant undersecretary of green development in the climate change sector of the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment in the UAE. Welcome, Aisha. Thanks for joining. Um, we also have Sheikha al Mazrui, who is the executive director of integrated environmental policy and planning with the Environment Agency of Abu Dhabi. Thank you very much for joining today, Sheikha. We also have um, Dr. Diana Francis, who's the Head of Environmental and Geophysical Sciences Lab at Khalifa University. Thank you for joining, Dr. Diana, welcome. Um, we also have Giovanni Durbano, who is the Head of Emission Regulation with the Swiss Federal Office for the Environment. Thank you very much for joining, Giovanni. 
And last but not least, we also have Suzanne Lindo, who is um, the Policy Officer with the European Commission DG Environment. So we'll hear from all of these excellent speakers. And it's really nice to see um, some gender balance as well. So, um, so it's good. You don't often see uh, that in these sorts of events. So um, you usually have mammals, but uh, today it's a mix, which is great. So over to you, Francisca, for your remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tanzit, and uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Fontana, for setting the scene. For Switzerland, uh, reaching the SDGs, uh, among others, by creating platforms for exchange and uh, knowledge sharing is a priority. That is why my position um, as regional sustainability advisors in the GOOF was created. Although Switzerland is not a member of the EU, we fully support the European Green Deal. As active UN member, we contribute to the extent possible to the healthy air, healthy planet engagement. And as friends of the UA, we are happy to exchange bilaterally and in multi-stakeholder platforms on policies, implementation and uh, results, uh, especially um, with the help, with the support of our um, Ministry um, of Environment. And with that, I give it, I give back to you, Tanzit. Great. Thank you so much, Francisca. So um, we've had the opening remarks now and we'll go straight into the panel discussion. We'll have, um, each person has five minutes to outline some opening remarks. There are some PowerPoint slides as well that um, different people have. Um, so if anyone has questions on those slides that people are presenting or anyone specific opening remarks, feel, feel free to start asking questions in the Q&A part of the, the Zoom um, link. And um, so yeah, over to you, Drew, um, the chair of the CCAC Scientific Advisory Panel. Happy clean air day and blue skies. I'm seeing blue skies outside of my window, although I got an alert from my air quality app saying um, to be aware of Dubai's air quality today. So. Um, over to you. Thank you, Tanzin. And I, I hope you breathe uh, clean air today and it, it doesn't do you any harm. Uh, well, thank you all for inviting me to participate into this, in this uh, International Clean Air Day for Blue Sky Celebration. Um, as, as we heard, I work with the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and I'm at Duke University, which you can see in my background in the United States. I wanted to talk kind of in a broad perspective about links between climate and clean air. And, and those links are really incredibly profound. We have both the, some pollutants such as methane or black carbon or other particulates that both contribute directly to climate change and contribute to particulate air pollution or in the case of methane to ozone air pollution. And even for pollutants that do not directly play a role in the air quality story, like carbon dioxide, the same sources, primarily fossil fuel combustion, which releases the bulk of the CO2 to our planet's atmosphere, is also one of our main sources, of course, of air pollution. So it's really impossible to separate these neatly. There's very little you can do to deal with climate change that does not affect air quality. There's very little you can do to improve air quality that does not impact climate change. That may seem, and sometimes does seem, to policymakers like a, an irritatingly or frustratingly complex situation. But actually, I think that there's some wonderful things about this because as, as we heard from the ambassador, the impacts of air pollution are really enormous. We, we, he mentioned the recent finding from the World Health Organization that air pollution, exposure to excessive air pollution is responsible for around 7 million deaths per year, according to World Health Organization estimates. That, while it seems like an outrageously large number, is actually a relatively conservative number given what recent epidemiology and recent literature has concluded with one of the most recent studies based on a meta-analysis of, of lots of new work coming out in developing countries finds more than 10 million um, premature mortalities per year just due to particulate matter related to fossil fuels. 
that's really an enormous number. Recent analyses of the effects of ozone have around a million premature deaths per year. So you put those together, and this is, is by far the leading cause of environmental uh, premature death. But it's, it's not only that, it's one of the top few leading causes of any sort, along with things like tobacco and, and poor diet. What that does is that means that when we try to deal with climate change or air pollution, we have the possibility of, of reaping enormous gains in public health. And so it's, it's common to talk about things like the WHO emphasizes that millions of people dying per year, but it's not only that. And one of the things that I have found recently to be a powerful driver of interest from the policy community, at least here in the United States, is that we are getting a better and better understanding and not just of people dying, but of all sorts of other impacts on society related to both air pollution and climate change. And so that includes the number of people that go to the hospital for asthma because they breathed in dirty air. That includes the number of people who can't go to work because they breathed in dirty air. And even more important than the number of people who can't go to work themselves is people with small children or caring for elderly people. Uh, parents or, or other relatives, you know, the children and the elderly are most susceptible to air pollution. And so often people can't go to work because they have to stay home and take of a child who's sick because of air pollution or, you know, their grandmother or their elderly mother. All of these effects add up to enormous amounts of drain on the economy. We also have effects on agriculture, which, which are very clear and can be readily defined. We have effects on labor productivity for heat as well. And that's actually a particularly interesting one in the Middle East where across the Arabian Peninsula, we see some especially profound effects of exposure to very high heat. And so this is not people working in office buildings indoors, which might be air conditioned, but people that by the nature of their work have to be outside, people working in construction, people working in utilities or deliveries or people working in agriculture and especially near the Gulf, the warm air that comes off of the Gulf in the evening keeps the temperatures drop from dropping at night. And so it's difficult to even adapt to this by moving to another time of the workday. Another interesting thing from the Middle East is the effect of all of the particulates in the dirty air on solar power. And as we deploy more and more solar power stations in places like the UAE and other desert areas in particular, we see both particulates from windblown desert dust, but also from sectors like transportation falling on the solar panels, dirtying them. And it's a difficult area to get enough water to clean them. So we find losses of up to 20% around the Arabian Peninsula in solar power. What this means is actually something fantastic. You know, you hear the saying that it's expensive to deal with climate change, but it's even more expensive not to. And while that is definitely true, when you take the perspective of just damages from climate change, what you're really asking society to do is spend a lot of money now to avoid a lot of damages or alternatively have a lot of gains in the distant future. If you also include air pollution, however, you find that spending money now means gains now. The gains now are primarily from air pollution. And in the long term, the gains are primarily from avoided climate change. And so within the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, just to close, this is the kind of thing we have built lots of tools to support policymakers. Um, nations that want to say include clean air within their nationally determined commitments and their, their contributions to the F UNFCCC can quantify and see all these benefits and convey to their citizens all of the wondrous things that they get by addressing climate change, which simultaneously cleans up the air. So I'm happy to talk about that more and thank you again for my, inviting me. Back to you, Tan Tanzi. Great. Thank you, Drew. Very, uh, very nice opening remarks there. And I hope I am breathing clean air today. It looks really nice and blue. So um, I'll let you know later on when I'm taking the kids out to play football later today. So we'll see how that goes. 
Um, so now over to engineer Aisha of the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment. You have some um, slides to share as well. So uh, Karina, if you could play, please share your screen to make sure the slides are up. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning in the different time zone that we are uh, having today. And happy International Day for uh, Clean Air for a Blue Sky. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. So when we are uh, talking in general, how UAE is uh, handling the air quality and the air pollution portfolio, we should say that air quality is very much a recognized uh, global issue which poses significant risks on uh, the population. The World Health Organization considers clean air to be a basic requirement uh, of a human health and well-being and estimates that outdoor and indoor uh, air pollution lead to approximately the death of 7 million uh, premature death uh, worldwide each year. So UAE has already long recognized the important role of air uh, quality that it's playing and supporting an overall healthy and sustainable life for its inhabitants. Consequently, UAE afforded air quality a high priority and a key performance indicator under its national agenda leading to its vision 2021. And will similarly recognize air quality in the UAE Centennial 2071 plan objective, which place a strong emphasis on a high quality of life and sustainable community. Uh, the importance of air quality is also recognized in the national environment policy of UAE, and uh, it sits actually improving air quality as one of its eight priorities and specifies goals uh, for it. We go to the uh, next slide, please. So in this slide, you, you will see the main outline of the UAE environment uh, policy, uh, which is uh, recently adopted by our cabinet in November 2020. Uh, that national environmental policy for UAE aims to improve the quality of life in UAE and uh, now and in the future. It also uh, aims to preserve the ecosystem in UAE and sustaining their ecological uh, resources. We are aiming through this policy as well to integrate climate change and biodiversity considerations into the sector. Uh, we also aim to promote diversification and economic uh, prosperity. And finally, we are aiming to support the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals 2030. So within that policy, we are, uh, or the importance of this policy aims actually to you know, uh, set the scene or to transform the existing work that we are already working on as policies into a kind of a roadmap that will move or that will enhance our capabilities in governing the uh, air quality policies. Uh, in the next slide, you would see what are the main, uh, the next slide, please. In this slide, you will see the main environmental priorities that this policy focused on, which are eight priorities, climate change, preserving natural ecosystem, air quality, food safety and diversification of sources, sustaining local agriculture, sustaining lo uh, local livestock, integrated waste management, and finally, chemical management. So these are the main the priorities that we are working on in this policy. And in the next slide, you will see uh, a framework of our uh, air quality strategy, the UAE air quality strategy that we are working on developing it. Uh, the time frame for that strategy is from 2021 to 2031. So we are aiming to submit this strategy to our cabinet this year in order to uh, approve it. And then we will start to work on implementing that. We had this already specified the vision for this strategy to be around enhancing the air quality to contribute to safe and healthy environment that improves the quality of life. And the purpose of the strategy is actually to lead and coordinate uh, the actions from both federal and local uh, institutions for streamlined monitoring and management of air quality and effective mitigation of the pollution. 
uh, we had specified like five uh, strategic objects uh, objectives for this uh, for this strategy. They are around reducing the health impact linked to air quality or air uh, sorry air pollution, strengthening the policy framework and institutional framework that is related to air quality, promoting the adoption and implementation of a cleaner and innovative technologies, developing human resources and capacity building. Uh, of the government agencies, and finally, promoting awareness of air quality matters. So, in the next slide, you will see the, uh, uh, the framework and the structure. So basically, we had already specified the three main pillars in our strategy. The first pillar is around monitoring. The second pillar is around mitigation. And the third pillar is around management. And those pillars, we had also specified four main focus areas that we want to focus on. Uh, the focus areas about outdoor air quality, indoor air quality, ambient odors, and ambient noise. And every one of those focus areas, we had come up with actions, with KPIs, with deliverables that will be you know, easier for us to monitor and to, uh, to monitor the progress of this strategy implementation. Uh, in the next slide, you will see an overview about uh, an overview about our national climate change plan. And uh, in 2017, actually, UAE adopted the national climate uh, change plan 2017-2015. Uh, this uh, plan sets a framework for management of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, for climate change adaptation and the private sector driven innovative economic diversification. So the country is implementing the National Climate Change Adaptation Program that is geared toward identifying sectoral climate risks and defining action plans for enhanced resilience. To honor our commitment to Paris Climate Agreement and to strengthen the implementation of our National Climate Change Plan and the Green Agenda, UAE submitted its second nationally determined contribution in DC to the United Nations, which contains for the first time a nationwide greenhouse gas emission reduction target of 23.5% by 2030. So such goal is expected to improve the overall air quality in the country and to generate a new engines of economic growth in the form of environmental technologies and services. In the last slide, I would like to just give you an overview about uh, the UAE National Air Quality Index. Uh, we are actually monitoring the air quality through around 50 stations that are spread all over the country. And uh, when we do the calculation, we do the calculation based on the cabinet decree that we have, it, which is cabinet decree 12, 2006. And we are calculating according to the uh, five main pollutants included in there, which are the nitrogen oxide, carbon monoxide, ground ozone, sulfur dioxide, and the particulate matter. And the daily air, air quality index will indicate, uh, or it's indicating the color value and the dom uh, dominating air pollutant that is affecting the air quality. So through this, we have actually launched uh, last year and in the international uh, day for uh, clean air for blue sky, we launched the National Air Quality Platform that could be used as a reference and a platform for the public, for the scientists, for the researchers to go and to know about uh, the air quality uh, index or the air quality status in UAE. With that, I would like to conclude my remarks and uh, back to you, Tanzi. Excellent. Thank you so much, Engineer Aisha, for an overview of how the UAE is, uh, is policy framework and strategy. I'm sure we, you, your presentation or has already started um, sparing people to ask questions in the Q&A box, which I'll get to in the Q&A session. But um, if anyone else has questions from the audience, feel free to start submitting them through the Q&A function of Zoom or even on the chat box, whatever you're more comfortable with. So um, next, let's hear at the local um, Abu Dhabi level. Abu Dhabi, obviously the capital of the UAE and the largest emirate. Um, uh, and we have Sheikha Al Mazrui um, of the Environment Agency, Abu Dhabi. Over to you. Yes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Hello, everyone. I am delighted to be with you here in this uh, virtual room uh, to celebrate the uh, International uh, Day for Clean Air and Blue Skies. 
uh, we thank you for engineer Asha. She gave the overview uh, about what's happening in the Emirates. Maybe now I will dig a little deep, a uh, little bit uh, deeper on what we're doing uh, here in Abu Dhabi. Uh, at first, I would uh, like to highlight that um, there are like a shocking facts about air quality. Uh, across the globe, nine out of 10 people are breathing unclear uh, air. Also around 4.2 million of people dies yearly from uh, diseases or infection related to ambient air pollution. And that number is like, uh, is more than the number of people who are dying because of road and traffic accidents. So these are really shocking facts. Also air pollution is the largest uh, environmental uh, risk to public uh, health globally. So I think it's very important that we uh, focus, on a, a, uh, focus on it and give it like uh, a day uh, in the year. So if we uh, will start with what we're doing here um, in, in Abu Dhabi and EAD, um, our role in managing air quality, I would like to uh, let you know that uh, improving public health by reducing air pollution and improving air quality is one of EAD's strategic priorities. We are fully committed to playing our part to mitigate pollution. By several means, we have, uh, we're doing the monitoring and reporting on air quality. Well, we have like, uh, we are operating a network of 20 air quality monitoring stations spread around Abu Dhabi Emirate. We also have e-linking. We, we have e-linking with other entities, air quality monitoring networks, and we exchange data to help us manage it better. We are, we also, uh, we have, uh, we upgrade, we upgraded techniques for analysis, modeling, and reporting the information for the, uh, for the monitoring stations. Also conducting, we are, we're doing, con, uh, we're conducting scientific research to improve our knowledge on air quality. Strengthening the legal regulatory enforcement framework for air quality and noise. We're promoting the use of best available techniques in all sectors, energy, transport, and industry. Raising awareness and information, inform, uh, informing public about air quality stations through our air quality index. How air pollutants are measured and managed also in Abu Dhabi. Since 2007, EAD operates the network of 20 air quality monitoring stations spread around the Emirate. The data from all EAD stations is shared in real time through a website. It's called adairquality.ae, so public can make informed decision knowing the state of air quality in the Emirate. The information is displayed using air quality index. The index is an indicator for reporting the air quality in the specific area. It tells you how clean or polluted the air is and when and uh, what health effect is associated with this uh, index, with it. Also EAD calculates the air quality index uh, based uh, based on um, uh, on concentration of five major pollutants over a set of period of time, which are uh, the particulate matters, uh, nitrogen dioxide, carbon uh, monoxide, sulfur dioxide, the, and the ground level ozone. The air quality index is calculated according to the U.S. EPA air quality index classification. The, the index also uses very easy to read uh, color coded uh, system to share the information to public to make it easy for them to know uh, the values and range. In addition to that, in addition to the air quality index, EAD produces the air quality emission inv emissions inventory in 2018 to better understand man-made air pollutant emission across various sectors in the Emirate and inform future policies uh, and regulations. The EAD air emission inventory showed that the road transport emission co contributes highly uh, to, the, uh, to the air quality. Also, we, we, we can highlight to you uh, a positive thing, which is what caused an improvement in air quality during the lockdown uh, in Abu Dhabi. The air quality monitoring networks data confirms that the 
prevention measures, um, prevention measures to control the coronavirus pandemic had a huge impact on air quality, largely to, due to the reduction of in traffic related to working and studying from home and to the reduction of other human activities. During lockdown, traffic was reduced by 48% in Abu Dhabi Island and had drastic reduction uh, during to some uh, period. Once uh, movement restrictions were uh, uh, lifted, emission gradually in increased. Uh, so uh, the global health crisis fo forced all of us to dramatically change our behavior in order to protect ourselves and the community. It is also a great opportunity to change our consumption and mobility behavior and adapt more low carbon ways to, uh, or uh, more carbon ways to uh, our ways to uh, live uh, uh, to, to lie on uh, of life to reduce emissions and improve the health and uh, health quality of the planet. When it comes to policies and initiatives that can help sustain improvement. Uh, during the lockdown, we have several uh, initiatives in Abu Dhabi that uh, helped also uh, to reduce, to uh, improve air, um, uh, air quality. We have the Sustainable Surface Transport, Transport Master Plan that is led uh, by DMAT. Uh, we also have the Abu Dhabi Low Emission Vehicle uh, Strategy that, is, uh, that has took place since 2016. We have also the low emission government fleet studies that we uh, worked along with the Emirates Nature WWF on it and uh, several other stakeholders. We have also uh, the uh, ultra low sulfur diesel um, uh, that was introduced by ADNOC. We also have the, uh, the new government uh, framework for charging electric vehicle that was announced lately by uh, Department of Energy. And we have also the walking and cycling master plan that is led by uh, DMAT, which, uh, which is uh, to expand the walking and cycling path, path uh, in the Emirate. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Sheikh al -Mazuri. Um We'll get to some of these very interesting points during the dialogue as well, especially about some of those initiatives that you know, your, your monitoring of air quality during lockdown last year. Um, uh, while we're on the UAE theme, we, we next have uh, Dr. Diana Francis um, from Khalifa University, because they've been doing some really interesting work on the science and monitoring of air quality in, in the UAE. <clears throat> Over to you, Dr. Diana. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm very honored and pleased to be a part of this event. And uh, I'm, I'm very um, interested to actually highlight the, the perspective from the academia and the scientific research on this important question, which is air quality and uh, its link to climate change. Uh, more specifically, uh, at the level of uh, the Khalifa University, um, the university has been involved since its beginnings in uh, the question on uh, the re-environment in general, uh, but more specifically on the air quality and the air pollution. Uh, uh, where many activities were initiated under the Master Institute, and, uh, and this has been achieved through uh, both uh, observations and modeling activities, which involve faculties, uh, research, and students as well. Uh, this is on the internal level, but also the university is always keen to expand on the uh, outside the university level, where uh, many partnerships were uh, built. Uh, during the last few years with the key players in the air quality and the environment uh, sector, such as the Ministry of Climate and the Environment, such as the Environment Agency in Abu Dhabi and many other uh, government entities. Uh, basically, this is very important because we know that the science knowledge is the backbone of all policies and uh, and uh, long time uh, strategies to combat uh, uh, poor air, air quality and improve the air that uh, the people in the UAE and, uh, and in, in all the countries are breathing. So this is uh, basically uh, the, the objective of all the activities that are being uh, conducted at the university. And uh, all the knowledge that uh, is being produced will, uh, will uh, help actually to build 
uh, science-based knowledge and science-based recommendation to uh, the governmental entities in order to help them uh, design and establish the, the right uh, strategies to reduce uh, air pollution in general. So uh, if, for example, uh, I take uh, the example of the Environmental and Geophysical Sciences Lab at Khalifa University, uh, for instance, we are responsible for the air quality forecasts at the level of the entire UAE. Uh, these forecasts we, we do it by modeling, but also by relying on a huge network that is maintained by the ministry. Uh, and uh, we communicate our forecast to, uh, to the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment on a daily basis. Uh, so the ministry can share these with the public and that can serve as guidance for vulnerable groups uh, in the UAE. Also, uh, NGO Lab at the Khalifa University is working uh, very closely with uh, the environmental agency in Abu Dhabi to uh, assess the impact of air pollution, for example, on the weather patterns and link it to the climate uh, in both ways, uh, which is um, a pattern that is um, uh, indirectly impact the air pollution, uh, although it, uh, it is really accounted for in such plants, because we know when air pollution is, is high, it can change the, the temperature, it can change the, the wind patterns, and then we have feedback again on the pollution. From the scientific point of view, the main findings that we have uh, uh, achieved and the, the insight that we uh, observed here in, uh, in the UAE is that, for example, we have a season seasonality in the air quality where uh, uh, we have poor air quality uh, during the summer season, especially, which also is linked to what uh, Dr. Drew has mentioned in his talk into the high temperature uh, over this region also. Uh, second main finding was that uh, the main contributor to the particulate matter, for example, is from natural aerosols. Uh, and we have also some uh, polluted uh, aerosols that are uh, originally natural, but when they are transported over polluted areas, they became polluted uh, aerosols. And these are very harmful for, uh, for the human health. Um, <clears throat> Another key finding was that the air quality in the UAE depends also on the level of emissions uh, in the countries that are around uh, the Arabian Gulf, uh, because uh, given the wind patterns over the, the UAE, whatever is emitted around the Arabian Gulf, uh, it is transported to, towards the UAE by the, the wind patterns that uh, we know it exists here over the region and called Shamal winds. All this, for example, uh, can help uh, to make ways and, and, uh, and climate that very complex with, uh, with the air pollution. So uh, we need very advanced techniques to unentangle this interconnection between air pollution and, uh, and the climate, especially over arid regions uh, such as the UAE. Uh, now uh, I would like to highlight also that uh, this uh, question uh, can't be solved at the only local uh, local level, but it requires regional collaborations uh, because we, know, we all know that uh, uh, air masses and air pollution, uh, they know no borders. So whatever is emitted uh, anywhere at some places will, will be uh, transported to uh, and will be in the atmosphere and will account as pollution as well. So uh, that's why regional collaboration with uh, both the governments and the, the uh, academia is very uh, important in order to come up with uh, common common idea and strategies to uh, cut emissions in, in this region and uh, improve the, the air quality of uh, uh, the air quality and the air that is uh, being uh, uh, is being uh, breathed by by our society. Yeah, I'm happy to, to also discuss uh, all of this further during the Q&A session. And uh, many thanks again for uh, having me here. Back to you, Tansi. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Ayan. I really appreciate your, your remarks there of the good work that Khalifa University is doing and also making that connection with science and policy, which we'll, we'll dive into more. Um, we are running a little bit late, but um, I, we still need to hear from two other speakers and, and then we'll um, do our best to get into them 
uh, do our best to get into the, the Q&A. We may need to go a little bit over time just to make sure we have enough time to answer the questions. So I hope that's okay with the, the rest of the speakers. Um, but over to you, Giovanni, from um, the Swiss Federal um, Agency for the Environment. Thank you very much, Tanzit, uh, for your kind introduction. And uh, thanks to the EU and Swiss Common Initiative in organizing this event. Dear ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to give this talk today on the Swiss strategy on air pollution control. You will see the step-by-step -step approach. Uh, as an example, uh, we took the case of uh, emission reduction of diesel suit as part of the particulate matter, and this for the transport sector. Policy, uh, this is um, the roots of the, of the strategy, uh, in, at least in Switzerland. Uh, we use the precautionary principle and uh, request the best available uh, technology. This is uh, stipulated in, the, in our Environmental Protection Act. Um, this means, like shown um, on the zip, on the closing zip, uh, by closing the emission gap, it requires the application of the precautionary principles. It means a gradual tightening, reducing of limit values by enforcing the use of the best available technology in each sector. This has to be done over the time, like in the picture. And um, it is important, uh, moreover, to, to know that the adaptation of the emission limit values in legislation has to be done independently of the existing air pollution. Uh, the next slide shows uh, the challenges for the, um, on the human health side, um, that our goal is to reduce uh, as much as possible the exposition risk for the population to toxic and the carcinogenic uh, air pollutants. For example, the exposition to soot and other uh, similar components, soot also called uh, black carbon, is emitted by uncompleted combustion processes like uh, for example, in internal combustion engines. Soot particles are in the size range of ultra fine particles, PM uh, 0.1 or 100 nanometers, are also carcinogenic to humans according to WHO. They are to be found in the air quality measurements of PM 10 and PM 2.5 in large number, a high number of particles uh, with a very small mass. The next slide shows uh, the challenges in the emission reduction technology seen as um, best available technology based on the air pollutant we, we want to uh, treat. Um, you see for different pollutants, uh, the well-known uh, technologies which have been applied uh, today on millions of, of, uh, of engines around the world oxidation tree catalyst, uh, uh, diesel particulate filter, denox system uh, for diesel engine and also gasoline particulate filter for petrol engines. Uh, you see also the air of introduction of, of which technology. It's important that we use for these technologies, we use uh, very high quality fuels like uh, ultra low sulfur fuels. In the next slide, you see um, the initiative in Switzerland, the action plan for the go, uh, from the government to started 2006 uh, on different several uh, on different uh, diesel sources like passenger cars, public transportation, construction machinery, ships, locomotives, and heavy duty vehicles, uh, in order to implement the best available technology on on current in use uh, machines and vehicles as well as on new ones uh, with the use of efficient diesel particle filters. And we have uh, reached a very good introduction in all categories, um, also on uh, agricultural tractors and uh, snow groomers, which adopt stage five from, from the EU with a particular number limit. For diesel engine, uh, we still need to work on categories like stationary engines uh, and on the, the rest of the fleet. Uh, on the side of the results uh, showing the reduction, um, you can see on the left graph the reduction of soot, black carbon in the air in Switzerland over the years. Uh, we are slightly below the level of one microgram per cubic meter in the ambient air. Thanks to introduction of efficient uh, particulate filters, we can see a strong reduction of soot in the ambient air 
still a lot of work has to be done in the future. According to air quality recommendation, a safer value for the exposition of the population is 0 0.1 microgram per cubic meter. The same is also valid for PM 2.5. In particular, urban configurations and along roads are spots where the values still exceed the air quality limits. We need to continue to adapt our emission limit values according to the best available technology over the time. And last but not least, uh, we all need every day a huge quantity of air to breathe and we have to ensure that the air quality will be free of toxic pollutants today and in the future. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Hey, thank you, Giovanni. That was a very, very um, insightful uh, presentation there. So um, I, I wanted to just clarify on the time. We have um, uh, Sheikh al Mazrui will need to leave sharp at 1 p.m. So um, I will um, go on to the next presentation now, but after that, I would like to start by asking her a question before she leaves. So um, I'll just kind of switch around and ask her a question first. I hope everyone understands that. Um, so over to you, Suzanne, for your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, and so much good has already been said. I'll try to be very brief. Uh, you can start next slide, please. What I'm going to do is run you through very quickly, a little bit what we do uh, on EU policy, and then pick up a few good practices and lessons learned from our experience that maybe can be helpful also to others. So first, um, what you see here on the slide is the EU policy framework. Basically, at EU level, we put out a framework for which is then used also for the national legislation of every EU member state. So we put the, the, the bigger picture, you can say. Um, we have three pillars to our clean air legislation. On top of this, this triangle is the air quality. So the concentrations of pollutants in outdoor air, legislation on, on how to monitor, how to measure, um, what limit levels apply, etc. cetera. On the down uh, to the left, it's the national emissions framework setting reduction commitments for every EU member states for the five main pollutants impacting health and the environment. And the third pillar down to the right is the source specific legislation. That's where we go a little bit more into details on, on rules uh, impacting the, the main emission sectors, vehicle standards, fuel standards, limit levels for, for industrial emissions or energy efficiency rating for buildings, that kind of things. Uh, as Ambassador Fontana already mentioned also, the, uh, I'm still on the last uh, previous slide, but um, we, we also have this bigger strategy of the Green Deal and the Zero Pollution Action Plan um, that sort of wraps it up all together and, and brings up more targets. And now we can go to the next slide, please. So, of course, as already others have mentioned, there are a lot of challenges. There are also opportunities, and I wanted to mention this. A challenge that we have is that air pollution is invisible. As you said, Tanzid, a blue sky is no guarantee of clean air. You can't see it with your eyes if it's polluted or not. And the problem is that people will not react and they will not demand or accept change if they do not understand that there is a problem. And this is the opportunity that we have. Um, I'm showing you on the screen, a screenshot from our air quality index. Uh, I was really interested to hear from Sheikha and Aisha about your work on, on your air quality indexes. We have something similar. It is uh, a map. It shows real time air quality data all throughout the EU. It's open source. Anyone can use this for apps or for science purposes. You can zoom in on the map to see the air quality right now at the location that you are. This has had an immense impact. It's a really powerful tool to make people aware about the problem. There are some things that we can do at EU level. We can, we can ban certain products or, or we can set emission limit levels. Um, we can provide funding and we can facilitate information exchanges. There are other things that we cannot do very efficiently at the EU that needs to be done nationally or even locally developing an air quality plan or establishing a low emission zone in a city, maybe provide incentive schemes for families to be able to um, replace a dirty heating or cooling system in their buildings. And then if we go one step further down, there are also plenty of things that we can do 
each and every one of us as individuals, the food that we choose to buy, the mode of transport that we use. Um, I put these uh, measures also on, on the slide. I hope that the organizers can make these slides available to you and you can go deeper into these proposals. We have many more on the European Commission website. So next slide, please. Um, all of this is needed. We need to work at all sectors from all stakeholders and at all the levels to achieve air pollutant levels that do not harm human health and the environment. And that's why I'm, I'm really happy to be here on the International Clean Air Day. And I look forward to discuss further with you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Suzanne. That was really insightful with the data and how that, um, especially that has, has affected how people engage with the topic. Um, Sheikha, if I could ask you please to turn on your camera. Um, before you go, I'd like to ask you um, one question, if not two, if I can squeeze in two. So the first one for you, Sheikha, is um, how is EAD synergizing policies between air quality and climate change? Poor air quality and climate change are um, closely linked. The energy, industry and transport sectors generate both air, quality, uh, uh, air pollutants and uh, greenhouse gases. Thus, policies uh, reducing GHG, um, GHG uh, emissions from these sources will help improve the air quality and health at the same time. Uh, EAD, through um, our sister organization, AGD, conduct a comprehensive assessment of the co-benefits of positive, positive impacts of that GHG could have in the air and public health. Though reduction in the uh, incidence of, for example, respiratory illnesses, uh, disease uh, and allergies uh, had shown, the results of the study indicates that future efforts in the Abu Dhabi Emirates to expand, the, uh, to expand and uh, intensify GHG Re uh, reducing activities using uh, innovation technologies, in innovative technologies, particularly in the, uh, in the energy and transport sectors, where the majority of potential GHG re uh, reductions exist, will lead also in sub uh, substantial public, uh, public health co-benefits. We also are working on air quality policy uh, that will be, inshallah, uh, uh, produced by maybe early uh, next year. We're, uh, we're focusing on four pillars on that policy. It's, uh, it will focus on ambient air uh, quality, indoor air quality, uh, noise and uh, odor. Thank you so much, Sheikha. I appreciate you need to go to, because you have a really important commitment right now. But thank you so much for your, your time today. Um, I'd like, you're welcome, thank you. And uh, I'd like to invite the rest of the panelists, please, to open, uh, turn on your cameras and we'll go into the, the Q&A as planned before. Excellent. So um, I'd like to pick up this theme on the synergies, synergies between policies. Um, there's a lot of different kind of topics that you've all raised, um, but I think this could be something you hopefully can all comment on. Um, maybe let's start at the global level with Drew. Um, what um, kinds of, you know, does, does what Shaker mentioned to you, is that kind of in line with what you're seeing globally in terms of the synergies of actions and policies on climate change and air quality? Well, I'd say yes, that's in, in general in line, but there's certainly a, a wide diversity across countries. And depending on the, the level of economic development, you know, in, in less developed countries, there's a lot more attention to use of solid bio, biofuels uh, for cooking, sometimes for heating, depending on the, the latitude and the climate. Uh, whereas in advanced countries, much more on the energy sector and the transport sector. So uh, I would say that there is a growing recognition that, that there are some terrific synergies that can be captured by clever planning. Um, but yeah, the, the conditions vary widely from place to place. Great, thank you. And um, uh, related to this topic, I'd like to ask um, Aisha as well. You mentioned uh, Engineer Aisha from Ministry. Um, you mentioned you know you have a climate change strategy, and so kind of what kind of policies have had the greatest success in the UAE on on its air quality? Well, thank you very much, Sanzi. For actually, the UAE had strengthened the enabling policy framework for environmental protection and climate action through overreaching national policies such as 
يو اي انفايرمنت بوليسي يو اي سيركلر ايكونومي بوليسي ناشونال كلايمت تشينج بلان اند ذا جرين اجندا اوف ذا كانتري سو اول اوف ذوز بوليسيز اكشلي هاف سنت ا سترونج سيجنال ان مين ستريمينج انفايرمنتال كونسيدريشن انكلودينج ذا اير كواليتي فور اكزامبل وي سبيك اباوت ذا ناشونال كلايمت تشينج بلان which outlines the UAE priorities in terms of uh, climate mitigation and adaptation, uh, that plan has laid already concrete actions to be carried out in the short and long term. Uh, it is a pioneer policy in UAE that explicitly focused on climate change and under the mitigation pillar of the climate change, one of the identified opportunities is actually to develop a scientific and robust national emissions management system. So that will pave the way Uh, for initiating the development of a greenhouse gas and air pollutant inventory, which is a monitoring, reporting, and a verification system. And these activities are already ongoing and expected, inshallah, to, con to contribute to the overall improvement of air quality in UAE. Thank you, Aisha. Um, uh, Suzanne, you explained some kind of impact that you've had in, in the European Union, but with um, still 400,000 annual deaths from air pollution in the EU. Do you think your air quality standards are really strict enough? That's a really good question. Um, and first of all, I, I would also like to say I really uh, support um, the, what, what Drew said about the synergies with the climate. This is also something we believe strongly in that uh, air and, and climate, it goes together and we can gain a lot from, from dealing with this in a one atmosphere approach. But yes, the air quality limits, that's actually something we're looking into. It is, um, we, it's true that we, we still have a, a big challenge in this regard, and we did an evaluation, therefore, on our air quality legislation, finished uh, 2019. It found that we have scope to bring down our legal limits closer to the WHO recommended values, the scientifically set. And that's what we're doing right now. So we, right now we have a revision ongoing of our main directive looking at how can we come closer to uh, to the WHO um, recommendation. There is supposed to be an update hopefully soon from the WHO and we follow that very closely. We'll make a proposal based on that and it will go to the, uh, to the member state, the council and the parliament. So it's work in progress. You have to always keep looking at see where can we move it a little bit forward and still improve. There is always something more we can do. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, and actually related to that, I'd like to bring in Giovanni next as well. We've had a question, and I guess this is related to policies as well. Um, how did you reduce PM 2.5 on the roads? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, it's a very good question. Well, first in the strategy, we focused on the emission uh, from, from the engine as, uh, as exhaust. And uh, the focus was to, 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 to eliminate the carcinogenic part like the soot. There are other sources of, of particles um, in the PM2.5 from transport sector, like uh, the non-exhaust part like in, in the braking uh, events in, in the tire particles. And this is the this is a work we we It's been started at the UNEC level with the European Union, United States, Japan, and other uh, parties. And we try to regulate now, uh, we're going to regulate also this part in order to reduce uh, also the, the contribution to uh, from the transport sector to the PM 2.5. The same approach that we had for the, for the exhaust gas, uh, applying the best available technology like filters, we would apply maybe filters for the braking system in order to To, to maintain the, the particles uh, and, and not emit them uh, to the uh, ambient air. And, and Suzanne, in, in the EU, what's your experience been on? Um, I know you've had challenges with uh, like the Volkswagen diesel gate scandal, but um, in terms of reducing PM 2.5 on the roads, what's been your experience that's worked? We think that uh, actually transport is one of the sectors we have very well covered with uh, a strong legislative framework and there's plenty of, of awareness about these problems, both uh, PM, but also the nitrogen oxides, uh, especially from diesel. We have a set of, of legislation pieces and vehicle standards is one big part, uh, particle filters and, and such technical measures as you mentioned, Giovanni, but uh, also setting quite strict in the type approval of uh, 
what kind of emission limits must the vehicle meet to be allowed to be um, put on the road. And then this is also useful. So this is what we call the Euro standard. A, a car has a certain Euro standard, which says something about the emission levels of it. That can then be used by cities and by, by regions when they set up, for example, their low emission zone. Many of the European cities can then use and say, we only allow vehicles of a Euro standard for and up to be in our inner city. And that's, that's a really good way to, to communicate clearly with citizens. It has um, um, potential to, to really uh, target the most dirtiest vehicles and um, promote the cleaner ones. But it's, it's not just about the vehicle technology, it's how you drive. It's a lot of awareness rising of um, eco driving schemes, speed limits, it's connection with road safety. Um, the technical control of vehicles to make sure that vehicles actually keep meeting the standards that they were set uh, coming out that they're not tampered with. So police enforcement, you need a whole package of measures to tackle this in an efficient way. We are happy to share the experiences of, of the EU on this. And I think also um, something that might be helpful to other regions, we are working, of course, in the Air Convention in the UNECE region, and there are guidances on um, specifically emissions from mobile sources that I find very helpful. Those are available on the Air Convention website and uh, this is also something that maybe other regions can look into and find useful. Excellent. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, no, we'll pick up on the UNEC um, Air Convention uh, in, a, in a little while, actually. Um, I want to bring in on this topic of, you know, what has spurred my interest is this topic of science and policy, the interface between that. So I'd like to bring in Diana, Dr. Diana Francis on this topic. You're doing good work there and you mentioned you're already collaborating with EAD and the ministry. Um, in, your, in your view, what kind of um, science and evidence do you feel is really needed to help policymakers feel confident that they're making the right decisions on the topic? Yeah, thank you, Nancy, for this question. Uh, it's very important actually to, to have a clear communication between policymakers and scientists, uh, because whatever policy is uh, uh, put in place by policymakers uh, or governments, it needs actually to be uh, kind of uh, tested and validated on the ground in order to see what is the lacking or what, what improvements we can give to this policy or strategy. So uh, there should be a kind of uh, uh, the common, common uh, areas of, of interest between policymakers and scientists and that the communication uh, be uh, two ways between uh, these two in order to, to have a, a more optimal and efficient uh, strategies and policies in place. One example I can give, for example, for the UE, uh, uh, I know that now uh, a lot of effort is being put to elaborate the national uh, strategy for climate change and, and air quality. For example, uh, uh, the, the persons that are working on those strategies, uh, I think it's very interesting for them to know that uh, a large amount of uh, particulate matter that uh, we uh, detect in the UE can come from uh, other countries and therefore their strategies and uh, the indexes that will impose on the local uh, companies, for example, industries and uh, all this, should also take into account the transboundary transport. So this is one small example how science can, for example, uh, give insights on uh, what legislation should be uh, elaborated for a given country. No, thank you, Dr. Diana. That's a really good um, segue into talking about kind of um, regional collaboration as well. Um, are you collaborating on research at a regional level then on air quality and what you're doing? Yes, we have in the, so in the Middle East, uh, there, is, uh, um, there is some collaborations going on, especially between universities, uh, but also between, uh, for example, uh, 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 government entities that are interested or um, uh, need some, uh, some uh, uh, highlights on some issues related to air quality. So there are some collaborations, but nevertheless, we, uh, uh, we encourage actually all scientists that are working on air quality to uh, do more, to engage more scientists, more researchers, uh, because in my view, this is the best way that we can have 
uh, you know, a, a regional view, let's say, on the issue of uh, air quality in, in the region. Really, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Diana. Yes. Um, um, I, I want to pick up on this topic that Suzanne mentioned about the UNICE Air Convention. Um, maybe I could start first with you, Drew, because you have that global kind of overview. Um, uh, it's been, I guess, successful in, in certain regions. Um, but kind of what, what's your kind of helicopter view of the convention and its successes? What are the, yeah, what's worked? Could you share some best practices, please? Well, I think the UN ECE region has done a wonderful job and the Convention on Long Range Trans Transboundary Air Pollution, ClearTap, has also, which includes North America as well as ECE and also the East, um, Japan, Korea, Russia. You know, these have been very successful. Part of the reason they've been successful is they have been strengthened after the initial uh, agreement with with really binding protocols that include some firm monitoring commitments. And that's really made all the difference because in contrast to that, we have uh, examples like the Southeast Asian nations where much of the pollution comes from fires and they, they go from one country to the other. And they've all agreed to work together to, to limit haze, but without anything binding, it's really not been very successful at all. It's been rather disappointing. So we, we I think, could, you know, an area like the Middle East or indeed anywhere in Latin America, Africa, you know, could really benefit from following the example of the, the ECA region, which has been really successful. One thing that's still challenging is how to link that directly with climate because of the difference in scale. And so th that's something where, for example, the CCAC has some tools which can help policymakers relate national air quality benefits with global climate uh, change. So that's an area for future progress. Thank you. Um, thank you, Truth. Suzanne, do you have anything to add on this point from the EU perspective? Yeah. I. We have worked quite a lot with uh, with the UNEC Air Convention, this blurt up. Uh, it's been, um, it had its 40th anniversary uh, some year ago. So it's it's really well established, super useful. It's a science network, but also a pol policy dialogue platform that we find, find very important. And as you say, the protocols ratified by parties making it binding, that makes a difference and it's important. I would strongly recommend other regions to, to look at this example and see if you can be inspired by it because it has helped us. Um, but also I, maybe to add um, beyond the possibility of regional conventions, there is already also some, a bit of a global framework, not in the same way as a convention with binding protocols, but we have a sort of a global checklist in the form of the UNEA Res Resolution 3.8, which can also be very useful as a, a starting point and just to make sure that you tick the boxes of what is needed as for basic uh, clean air policy framework. That's a good starting point, I think, for also discussions at global level of, we should talk more about how is this followed up and, and to what extent it, it, it is actually implemented in different regions in the world. Um, I, I find really um, the transboundary dialogue and cooperation a great opportunity, as you say, to, air pollution doesn't stop at borders. So we need to talk across uh, within regions and between regions and see what can we do together because we are all affected by each other's uh, pollution in the end. Yes, um, Engineer Aisha, um, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. You know, obviously we heard from Dr. Diana that the UAE's air quality is dependent on what its neighbors are doing and at a regional level. And um, so what kind of collaboration um, are you or the UAE government um, undertaking on this topic with regional partners? Well, uh, as you say, I consider the world, the whole world as a small village and we are all connected with each other and we are affected, you know, with whatever is happening over the world will affect every part of the world in a way, in a direct way or indirect way. So for sure, under, you know, the international agreements that we are part of, uh, under the different MOUs that we are signing with different countries or with alliances and with, uh, you know, uh, partners, we are trying to uh, identify the possible ways of collaboration in terms of enhancing the air quality. And uh, I would say initiating um, joint projects or initiatives together 
So uh, one of the um, work that we are doing is actually with the clean uh, uh, air and climate change coalition that we had uh, joined. We are actually benefiting from the pool of expertise that are already uh, within that coalition. And we are actually uh, expanding our knowledge in, the in terms of you know, enhancing the uh, different policies that could lead to uh, reducing the pollutants, which whether these pollutants are within the country or they are you know, transboundary pollutants. But for example, one of the initiatives that we are working on could be a kind of a practical uh, initiative. It's uh, the idea of the green belts that we are building in order to reduce the effect of the dust storm that we are affected by. Uh, UAE is not a country who is generating dust, but we are affected with the dust that are generated from the neighbors, um, uh, the neighbor, uh, the neighbors uh, countries. So this kind of collaboration is actually going on. And we are trying our best to meet our obligation uh, under the different concessions or the different agreements that we are part of. Great, well, thank you. Thank you, Engineer Aisha. You mentioned the dust, uh, the, the green belts and the dust storms. Um, I know Saudi Arabia is planning to, to develop some of these green belts as well. Do they really have um, an impact? Well, I would say that it's a practical control measure against the dust store, uh, it actually has scientifically proven. So aside from improving the air quality in the urban area, it also offers a wide range of win-win benefits, such as protection of natural environment and wildlife, enhancing the land use planning, preservation of rural heritage, and promotion of native vegetation. That all enable actually a leisure activities with enormous health benefits such as walking, cycling, and cabin. So they are really extra benefits for those green belts. Great, thank you. And, and while I have you, I want to just pose a question to you that um, um, someone has raised from the audience, uh, Sunil. Um, how is the UAE planning to address the indoor air quality problem in old and existing buildings? Well, actually, under the framework of the uh, newly developed UAE National Air Quality Strategy, we had already uh, specified one of the four focus areas to be around indoor uh, air quality. So under that one, we are already working on several initiatives, projects, legislation that will be initiated under that focus area once the strategy is uh, completed and once it's approved and it's enter its implementation stage. Great, thank you. And is the municipal, are the municipalities involved in this as well? Yeah, for sure. We are engaging all of the relative uh, relevant, uh, sorry, stakeholders, whether they are from federal uh, entities or they are from local entities like the municipalities and the environmental agencies. Also, we are engaging with the private sector with the academic sector, because this is a kind of a whole of a, a whole of a approach that needs to involve all the relevant stakeholders in the developing of this strategy. Otherwise, if you develop that strategy alone without the engagement of the stakeholder, then nobody will be implementing that strategy. So that's why we made sure from the beginning to involve all the relevant stakeholders. Right. I'm going to pick up on that point on stakeholder engagement um, very soon as well. But um, on this topic of indoor air quality and kind of kind of um, share in the interest of sharing experiences, um, uh, Giovanni, is this a topic that you're focusing on in, in Switzerland? Is it a big issue or, or how have you addressed it if it has been? Uh, take it and sit. Uh, yes, it's it's a very interesting issue. Uh, a little bit the problem uh, that we have in Switzerland that we uh, from the Environmental uh, Protection uh, Ministry, we uh, care about uh, outdoor air quality. This is our mandate from, from law. And uh, sometimes um, there is not so clear a uh, legal basis for the indoor air quality because uh, this is split between different ministries, like the one who, who need to regulate the, the chemicals, different chemicals also, and the protection of the workers. And um, I think um, 
in future, this will be uh, certainly a, a big issue because uh, we can see from different studies that uh, uh, sometimes you have higher, uh, worse air quality inside than uh, uh, in outdoor. Yeah, so it's growing and an emerging issue, great. So um, yeah, the next um, topic I want to bring the rest of you into is really thinking about kind of what sorts of um, other sorts of issues around air quality now, in particular around ground level ozone. Um, uh, Drew, if you do, you have any comments on this topic? I've seen some evidence that shows that ozone levels are rising and and it interacts with climate change as well. Is this something we should be concerned about, and how can it be managed? Well, in most of the world, particulate matter is the bigger burden for human health. But yes, I think we should be worried about this because ozone has proven very challenging to control. And even many parts of the world that have done a very good job on particulate matter and seen levels drop substantially have not made as much progress on ozone. So and furthermore, ozone is, is not only toxic to people, but also to plants. And so it it injures our crops and it also injures forests which take up carbon for us so it makes climate change worse. So there's a lot of good reasons to try to deal with ozone in very um, industrialized high population regions. It's often transport sector is a big contributor of, of nitrogen oxides which can lead to ozone formation. But another thing that's been happening is background ozone levels have been going up even in remote parts of the world. And, and they drift in, of course, they don't stay in remote parts of the world. And a lot of that's due to methane, which is it's responsible for about half of the increase in ozone over you know, pre-industrial levels. So we can certainly try to reduce methane leaks. Uh, places like the Middle East with large oil and gas infrastructure can try to get their leaks as much under control as possible. Those kind of Controls tend to be financially appealing as well, too. They save the industry money and they can help deal with our ozone levels. So it depends a little on, on where you are at the, in the city scale. I think it really is important to target industries and factories and power plants and cars. Uh, but broadly, we also need to cooperate again, like we've been talking about, cooperate internationally to deal with methane. Thank you, Drew. Um, Dr. Diana, do you, do you have anything to add on this topic around ozone in the UAE and the wider region? Yeah, I think uh, for, for the ozone question, uh, it's again the, the temperatures that are uh, uh, that will uh, accentuate actually the, the problem here in, uh, in, the, in, the, in our area, not only the UAE, but uh, in, uh, especially that, for example, the temperatures are projected to increase, uh, especially during uh, summer, summertime here in the due to climate change. So this kind of feedback between climate change and uh, pollution is really a, uh, a matter of concern for, for our scientists in, in other regions such as the UAE. Thank you, Diana. Um, Engineer Aisha, is this something that the UAE is gearing up to address as part of its air quality strategy? Um, the growing risks posed by ground level ozone here? Yes, indeed, because as we all know that uh, the ground ozone is a secondary pollutant that's coming from the chemical reaction of NOx and DOCs. I'm not going to lecture you about that, but just like when I'm mentioning that, I just want to mention that we are focusing on the sources of the VOC and the sources of the NOx itself. So from our inventory study that we conducted, we found that transport sector followed by energy sector and industrial sector are the main sources for the NOx and the VOC. That's why we are targeting those sectors in order to have more, um, I would say, initiatives and projects in order to reduce the, the emissions from those sectors. And as an example, I would say that uh, enhanced emission standards and vehicle inspection programs in the country are really helping us to address the risks caused by the ground level ozone. So that is a drive, driven by the growing demand um, uh, for more environmentally friendly modes of transportation. So our country is increasing its procurement of electric and hybrid vehicles. And the government is also expanding the capacity of public transport 
and improving the enabling infrastructure to encourage walking and cycling. On the other hand, UAE has adopted a wide range of policies and measures to reduce the effect resulting from energy sector. Uh, in that one, uh, we have several announcements for reducing the uh, emissions from the energy sector and diversifying the energy sources. So these are some of the measures that UAE are taking in order to uh, reduce the sources for the VOC and the NOxes that are resulting in formation of the uh, ground also. Thank you. And, um, and what are your planned future projects for the UAE to improve air quality? Well, I would say a comprehensive and a holistic approach is already identified within the strategy itself, the UAE uh, National Strategy for Air Quality. A list of projects and initiatives are already identified with the stakeholders and those uh, covering the outdoor, the indoor, the noise and the uh, odor. And they are covering the main sectors that are causing or emitting more pollutants um, affecting the air quality. And this will be the transport, the air, energy, industry, and the other you know, uh, economical sector in UAE that are affecting actually the, um, uh, the, the quality or the emissions of those pollutants. Great, thank you, Andrea. Um, Suzanne, maybe we can get the EU perspective on this. You know, what are what are the main opportunities for improving air quality ahead? What types of measures or the main sectors? What what are your practical next steps in the EU? Yeah, thank you. Um, I would say that for transport and industry, we we already have quite a well functioning and and robust framework for the, for the industry emissions, we're actually right now revising and reviewing the, the industrial emissions directive. Uh, so that seems to be quite uh, well taken care of. What we have found a bit more challenging and where I think more might need to be done is emissions from the agriculture sector. We see that ammonia is the pollutant in the EU that is uh, reduced the least and even increasing in some member states. So ammonia, and agriculture would really need to be, be more tackled. We recently adopted a new common agricultural policy that puts more emphasis on, on eco schemes. I hope this will be an, a tool to, to start working more efficiently uh, in this sector, but it's a, it's a tricky sector to address legislatively. And then the other sector we need to work on is uh, residential. So heating and cooling of buildings and it is difficult because it's people's homes. It's uh, many small buildings, not like industry, where you can have uh, permits for a few installations and you cover the whole emission sector, but with residential heating and cooling, um, you have to work in a, in a very different way and to help people make the right choices. But I would say residential and agriculture are two sectors we will look more closely into for the future. And then definitely this um, interface clean air and climate. I, I thought that it was really interesting that you brought up the ozone and the link with methane as a clear example of an opportunity that we haven't really taken on fully so far. And we maybe address climate and clean air a little bit too much, too separately. Climate uh, policy and environmental policy a bit uh, apart and with ozone, air pollution, methane, it's so clear that it comes together. and. Um, that's maybe an opportunity also where we can can try. I hope we will try yeah, coming ahead. Where do you think? It seems very synergistic in many ways, you know, from everything that everyone was saying. You know, and um, you know, I've got a question here from Karin and and Antoniades. Maybe you can answer this, Suzanne. Is what about electric vehicles? Can you elaborate on the policies and benefits that they provide in relation to air and quality and greenhouse gases? Yes. Um, I think Giovanni, you put it very well also. It's, it's about the combustion of fuel to a large extent, especially when it comes to the PM. And of course, uh, electric vehicles will uh, have a much better emission um, impact in that sense. But there will, of course, also be other aspects to take into account uh, sustainability of batteries, um, tire and brake abrasion will still be, be an issue. So it's 
you can't call them maybe zero pollution. But of course, it's a step in the right direction. And we try to promote in a good way this uh, uh, move away from combustion engines um, to the cleanest possible. If it's the cleaner Euro standard, going towards um, no fossil fuel uh, in the long term. We have parts of this in the Zero Pollution Action Plan and the Green Deal. I think that's really interesting development that we look forward to, but um, with these small caveats about things like the batteries, the source of the, the electricity, where does it come from? That must also be clean all the way to, to have all the benefits of this transition that we really hope for. Tanzid, can I make one, one other quick point that I think is kind of interesting about electric vehicles, if you don't mind? One, one sure, thing that... Yeah, one thing that I, I think is often uh, overlooked, and I, I think, you know, it still remains to be put into practice, but at least in modeling frameworks, by having a very large demand for electricity, where you can adjust the timing well, having a large fleet of electric vehicles with batteries can actually allow you to have more renewables on the grid as well. So it can really aid the overall transition away from fossil fuels in the power sector and facilitate greater use of renewables, which is really kind of a, a, a lovely additional benefit as well as not, nothing coming out of the tailpipes. That's good, yeah. Very, very good point. And um, I'm, I'm conscious of time. I, I, as I mentioned before, I'd like to keep this running for another five minutes or so, if that's everything's, if everyone's okay with that. We already have engineer Aisha had to leave. She had another meeting to go to. So um, in uh, yeah, thank you, engineer Aisha, on this recording. If you see it, we <laughs> thank you and, and bye. Um, but on this topic of electric vehicles, it's interesting because um, what's been the Swiss experience, Giovanni? Yes, thank you very much. Um, well, we see uh, a little bit different uh, as Suzanne has explained very well the, the situation. Uh, as the Environmental Protection Agency, we need to ask the critical question to, to coming uh, technologies. We see certainly uh, uh, an advantage in the local air quality because you, you have no direct emission from, from uh, an engine. You have no exhaust emission. You have you may you may have a, a particulate emission from brake and tires, um, uh, but we see that uh, the whole the whole picture is uh, uh, it moves from the in use of the vehicle to the manufacturing of the batteries, where pollution can happen first before the the vehicle is is manufactured and comes into the into the roads uh, and. We don't want to shift the pollution to countries where the vehicle, electric vehicles batteries are, um, are being uh, manufactured and we don't have any pollution in our countries like in Switzerland. And we, we, we need to, to work together at the global level. Uh, the, the key factor will be uh, how do you get the energy sector, the electricity clean uh, on the global scale? Because now it's, uh, it's main at the global level at least it's, it's uh, mainly based on, on coal fired or fossil fuels. This would be the great challenge in, 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 I, I see in, in, in the future with uh, electrification. And also uh, we, uh, we need to have into mind that we can, we can clean up uh, combustion engine now with the technology we can, we, with the upcoming Euro 7, in Europe, we you have the technology that you have almost zero emission at the uh, at tailpipe. It, it means that in future, for for activities where you cannot electrify, you cannot electrify. Maybe you could use biofuels or synthetic fuels, renewable synthetic fuel, in order to to have also uh, a transport sector with a very low uh, impact on the environment. It's important also that we consider the whole impact on the environment, not only the CO2, climate, uh, climate, uh, greenhouse gases, but we try to, to investigate in all environmental sectors that uh, there is no more pollution through new technology and recycling of batteries certainly has to be solved in the future. Great, thank you. So obviously not the only answer, but part of it, it needs a bit, bit of investigation, but, uh, but there seems to be some nice beneficial synergies there. Um, 
So one final question to, I'd like each of you to answer, but keep it really short and to the point. Um, one key point, yeah. So, you know, obviously we're all going to go away after this webinar and be citizens and residents in our own countries. So what do you think the individual can do? Suzanne. There is plenty we can do. And maybe if you have to focus on something, look at uh, the food you buy and the transport mode you use. And the good news is that mostly the cleaner choices will both be good for, for the air pollution, but also for climate, for your health and for your wallet. That's a good message to pass around. Thank you. I'm just going across what I see on my screen. Um, Dr. Diana? Quite similar to Susan, I think this is uh, combining the, the benefits is, uh, is uh, the most important uh, things to keep in mind uh, in everyday uh, actions. Thank you, Dr. Anna. And Giovanni? Uh, when, when I look also at our behavior, our family behavior, certainly we like to use all kinds of transport uh, uh, stuff. And uh, I think uh, maybe to avoid some 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 trips and, and think about uh, maybe trying to to use the, the best available uh, products uh, in terms of uh, environmental impact. Ah, yeah. sorry, I, I didn't didn't hear you call me Tanzi. Um, yeah, I agree with with what the others have said. I would say that the one additional thing is that you know you you can only buy an electric car, for example, if there's one for sale, and then sometimes they're only for sale if there are government incentives. So uh, I think that it's it's very important also to try to push your leaders to acknowledge that this is a real problem and to facilitate renewable power in your state or country or city and facilitate you know, active and transit and, and all of these things, which uh, yeah, if you're in a representative democracy, then you know go out and, and try to get the kind of candidate that will support that and otherwise whatever levers you have in your local context, uh, but push for that in, the, in your leadership. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, everybody, um, esteemed panelists, for, for joining. Um, I, I won't even try to summarize everything. I think it's, um, it's a really interesting, important topic. Um, we heard before it's absolutely crucial for public health that we have clean air to breathe. Um, blue skies don't necessarily mean the air is clean. So policies are crucial, regional collaboration is crucial, and implementing and financing practical projects on the ground. Um, there is synergies between climate change and air quality and, and measures to manage them. So the more we can find those synergies, the better. Um, I'd like to finally hand over to Francisca from the, the, Swiss, uh, from the Swiss Embassy to, to um, provide the final remarks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Tanzid, uh, for this excellent moderation, and also again to uh, Ambassador Fontana for the introductory words. And uh, for sure, a very big thank uh, goes to the panelists uh, for their competent and uh, instructive inputs and insights, and also for the, uh, to the audience uh, for their interest. Um, but I would also like to mention that such an event is not possible without the support of, uh, of uh, um, let's say, uh, back, back working uh, teams. So uh, the, the conceptual and also technical work uh, is very much uh, appreciated and the big thank goes to all these uh, background work team. Um, now, it, the only thing that remains uh, for me to say is to announce uh, again this event on the 12th of October um, at the Expo 2020 Dubai um, in the Swiss Pavilion. S this time, uh, or now we were talking about policies, uh, science and research, uh, and next time on the 12th of October, we would like to discuss with the private sector, a uh, private transport sector in the UAE, what it means for them. What are the measures they are taking? How binding and uh, let's say uh, um, guiding are also these policies that we heard about uh, in the UAE, but also maybe in, in other countries. Uh, how do they implement it? What does it mean for them, uh, let's say, uh, 
ecologically and economically? What, what strategies do they have? What footprints do they want to leave? So really to, to discuss uh, with uh, implementers of these strategies, uh, what it means uh, for them and uh, what they are doing um, to really improve um, their uh, or reduce their emissions and um, contribute to, uh, to better air. So with that, uh, I'm looking forward to meet you all um, uh, on the 12th of October. We hope that we manage to have this, uh, um, to have a hybrid event again. We heard about, uh, um, let's say, the contribution of the transport sector, including aviation. Um, it would be nice if we managed to have it hybrid, but it's also physically for the ones who live um, in, uh, in the UAE, uh, who are here anyway. Um, and there is actually a public transport to, which goes, uh, especially in Dubai, uh, from Dubai city to the Expo. Unfortunately, not yet uh, from Abu Dhabi to uh, the Expo Dubai. With that, I would like to uh, close the webinar and wish you a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye.